really, the, the, I'm here to, today to talk about, is there one God or is there many gods? You know, many people seem to think that there's a, a Muslim God or a Christian God or a Jewish God, and that God is different from the other gods, or there's a Hindu God or gods. And if we really look at the holy scriptures of all the major religions, all of them say very clearly that there's one God. For example, the Jewish Torah says, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In the Christian Bible, in the New Testament, it says that in John 17, 3, that there's one true God. It says throughout the Bible, one true God. The Quran says there's no God but Allah. Even Buddha gets into the action. He says there is an unborn, uncreated, unformed, and without this unborn, uncreated, unformed, we, the created, the formed, could not exist. That's a clear reference to a single God. So if all these religions <clears throat> are talking about a single God, then it would make sense that there is only a single God. So how do we reconcile all the different religions? How do we reconcile all the different names for God? So from a Baha'i perspective, we do believe in the single God, just like the Jews do, just like the Christians do, just like the Muslims do, just like Hindus, some do, most do, that I've met. And we believe that the single God is the creator of the universe. And that single God has sent messengers in every age. And so 5,000 years ago, he sent Krishna, and 4,000 years ago, Abraham, and 3,500 years ago, Moses, 3,000 years ago, Zoroaster, 2,500 years ago, Buddha, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, 1,400 years ago, Muhammad. And most recently, in the 1800s, he sent the Bab and Baha'u'llah to inaugurate this modern age. And there's always actually a pattern. There's a pattern with when he sends these prophets. Krishna, all those thousands of years ago, said that whenever the world grows dark, God will send a new avatar. That's their name for a prophet or a messenger. And so this avatar, and, and Baha'is call these avatars manifestations, which is actually quite similar, comes to the darkest place in the world, and they suffer greatly. And then what happens is they leave a golden age in their wake. So I'm going to go all the way back. I'm going to go back 3,500 years ago, and I'm going to go back to the time of Moses. And then in that time, the people who we came to were suffering greatly. Again, they come to the darkest place on earth. These people were suffering for hundreds of years in dire slavery in Egypt. And Moses comes in, and he's literally chased out of Egypt, he and his people, and have to run for their lives. And yet Moses leads them. He doesn't see the promised land, but he leads them. Actually, this is a, a glimpse of the promised land behind me. This is a, a picture of Haifa, Israel. And so th these thousands of years ago, very improbably, these slaves are led out of Egypt. And, they, and this becomes the golden age of Judaism, otherwise known as the kingdom of Israel, which lasts for hundreds of years. The next prophet to come right after Moses, 500 years later, is Zoroaster. So Zoroaster comes in Persia. And Zoroaster, they jail him. They jail him. The priests actually try to kill him three times. And for the first 10 years, nobody really listens to Zoroaster very much. Eventually, the king adopts his faith. And that becomes the kernel for the great Zoroastrian golden age, which lasts for over a thousand years. Now, some of you might be thinking, I've never even heard of Zoroaster. He's not as well known as some of the other messengers. But you might have heard of the great Persian Empire. And that great Persian Empire is literally running on Zoroaster's teachings. And so some of there's actually some Zoroastrians in the Bible, such as Artaxerxes and King Cyrus, who are mentioned in the Christian Bible. It's just not mentioned that they're followers of Zoroaster. The next one to come is Buddha. Buddha comes in, uh, I guess, right near uh, India right on the corner of India, and uh, he comes and he comes to, again, to an India that's, that's gone from its, its previous heyday, right after Krishna, it's kind of a dark place, and Buddha talks about exile and suffering. He's actually right by Nepal, right, kind of on the border of Nepal in, in India, and yet what happens is, again, very same pattern, a golden age arises in his wake. 
And it's actually the center of this golden age, just like the Persian Empire was the greatest empire of its day, which is called the Maurya Empire. The Maurya Empire hits 2 million square miles at its peak. So it's this great Buddhist empire, and it's running on the teachings of none other than Buddha himself. And Buddha, by the way, is not his name. It's Siddhartha. Um, but Buddha, he's, he's Siddhartha, the Buddha, just like the next one we're going to talk about, who is Jesus, the Christ. Not Jesus Christ, really, but Jesus the Christ or Messiah. So 500 years later, now the Jews have had their great golden age. Now they're suffering as we come to 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, they're suffering greatly under the harsh rule of the Romans. And their great spiritual power that they got from Moses has kind of faded away. And they're in a harsh, orthodox type of, of time. And so the religion is not as bright as it was when it was first revealed. And, and Jesus comes to this time. And of course, he only ministers for three years. And then he's crucified. And when, at the time he's crucified and is killed, he only has 120 followers. And pretty much the Romans and, and the Jewish leaders think they've washed their hands of this Jesus. There's a dozen other messiahs. Why is this one any different? And yet he is different because in his wake, you have a resurrection of his faith. And this resurrection, the disciples are, are, are really have the spirit of Christ come on them after a few days. And they go all over teaching this new faith. And eventually, after a few hundred years, Jesus fulfills the prophecies which is that he was supposed to take over Rome. And he does. It becomes the Holy Roman Empire, the center of this being the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, which lasts actually longer than the Roman Empire itself. It's a Christian empire, and it lasts for over a thousand years. Starting to see a pattern here. So that each empire is the greatest of its day. It's like God sends a light in the messenger, and that messenger spreads the light. It, it's like planting a tree. That seed grows slowly, slowly, slowly. Soon it's a sapling. And it's a small tree and eventually it's a it's a great big tree that bears fruit and it bears its fruit and then eventually that tree dies and god sends another tree and so 600 years after jesus comes muhammad and he comes to a terrible place terrible time he comes to a place in arabia and he comes to a place that's so terrible that they're burying their daughters alive and the reason they're doing that is men are killing each other so fast in battle that women have become expendable. Muhammad starts teaching what, what Buddha taught, what, what Jesus taught, what Moses taught, what Abraham taught. He starts teaching love and kindness and mercy and wisdom and justice and peace. And this divided people, this depraved people that were burying their own daughters alive, they unite and it becomes the golden age of Islam in his wake. This lasts for over 500 years. And they really invent the building blocks. They reinvent every field of human endeavor. And they, they create the building blocks for modern society. Things like chemistry and algorithms and al algebra. They all sound like Muslim words because they are. And uh, the first college, first university uh, happened in Morocco back, I think, in the ninth century, if I'm not mistaken. It's a long, long time ago. Um, so... All of these things, these great advancements happen under the Muslims. And remember what he came to, a society which was extremely depraved and very low. And yet he raises them to the highest heights. Now, meanwhile, Christianity has fallen. As, as Islam is hitting its golden age, Christianity is literally in an age that, that's called in history the Dark Ages. So if you look at it from a Christian perspective, this time was very dark. Now, Muhammad, he, he actually puts the light in the world. And so that light, shines on, on Northern Africa and the Muslim Moors take over Spain for the better part of 700, 700 years. And that light kind of goes into Christianity and that kind of lights up European Christianity, which had been so dark. And that's a real big part of what comes next, which is called the Renaissance. So essentially Christianity relights and Christians take over over the next few hundred years, pretty much the whole world, most of Africa, most of Asia, most of North America, South America, Australia. So what happens is we get to the modern world, and this is how we get to the modern world. Religion always plays a part. And so in the 1840s, there's a huge expectation that something's going to happen. Among Jews, among Christians, among Muslims, 
The Jews are expecting in 1843 things. They're reading a book called the Zohar, which is their book of mysticism. And the, the Zohar says three things. It says, number one, that the Messiah, the promised Messiah is going to come. <clears throat> number two, he's going to bring them back to the Holy Land. And number three, there's going to be a technological revolution worldwide. So number one, the Jews don't see the Messiah. They're expecting to see him in 1840, and they don't. The, the year 5600 in the Jewish calendar. But two other things do happen, which are quite interesting. Number one, in 1844, you get the Ottoman Edict of Toleration, and that starts this great Jewish migration back to what's now modern Israel. By 1948, there's over 600,000 Jews, today over 7 million Jews. And so that migration happens starting right on time in 1844. The other thing that happens is this technological revolution. Of course, we're on Zoom. Most of you on, are either on phones or on computers watching this. Those things didn't exist in 1844. Neither did plastic, neither did cars, movies, computers. You know, none of this existed. Airplanes, 75% of all inventions in the history of the world have happened since 1844. So the Jews get two out of three. They get the move back to what's now Israel. They get the move back uh, when we and they get the technological or we all get the technological revolution. But the Jews don't see the Messiah, as I mentioned. So we move on. Now we come to the Christians in the 1840s. The Christians all over the world were waiting for the second coming of Christ. This there are movements in Germany in France in Scandinavia in Switzerland in Sweden, 700 ministers in England, 300 ministers in America. It's called the Adventist movement. And there's some big names behind it. There was a man, some of you might know the name, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther predicted that in 1840, or by 1840, Christ would return. John Wesley, who founded the Methodist faith, he said that Christ would return in 1836. And Joseph Smith, the Mormons, he kept on predicting the return of Christ. In fact, in 1843, he said, to the people he was speaking to, there are those of you who will not pass away before Christ returns. And he actually uh, singled out 1863 as, as a key year and 1891, which are key years, actually. But the biggest one in this movement was a man named William Miller. William Miller starts out as a farmer. He survives very miraculously the War of 1812, and he becomes very religious. And he reads the Bible for a couple straight years. And by 1831, he has this theory and that Christ is going to return in 1844. He tells his family, but he makes a vow between him and God quietly. I'm not going to talk about this publicly. He's kind of a shy guy unless I'm asked to. And less than an hour later, after he does this, his son-in-law says, hey, the uh, preacher is not going to be in church on Sunday. Can you tell him about this theory that you have about the return of Christ? So he does. 13 years later in 1844, William Miller has 100,000 plus followers. And they're all waiting for Christ to return. And the Bible at that time said the world would end. So they're all waiting for the end of the world. The Bible's more modern Bible say end of the age. But back then it said end of the world. And they're waiting on October 22nd, 1844. The world does not end. They don't see Christ coming in clouds as they expect. And so it's called the Great Disappointment, October 23rd, 1844. And that ends our story. And, and all of the Christian... Um, movements end in great disappointment. But we have one more, one more still out there, and that's the Muslims in Persia. What's interesting is what William Miller didn't know, um, and that is the Christian Bible actually says the number 1260 in 10 separate verses, seven in Revelation, three in the book of Daniel. All the prophetic parts of the Bible are talking about 1260 over and over and over again. But 1260 doesn't mean much to a Christian. I've actually never met a Christian who has any idea what 1260 means, but it means a lot to Muslims. In fact, in the year 1260, almost all of Persia, now modern day Iran, was waiting for the coming of the 12th Imam. You see, he disappeared in 260 and he's gonna return, they thought, in 1260. And 1260 just happens to be the exact same year that William Miller was looking, 1844. The exact same year the Jews come back, or start coming back to Israel with the Ottoman Edict of Toleration, and the exact same year that the modern age of communication that we're in kicks off on May 24th, 1844, with the very first telegraph, 
what hath God wrought? So in Persia, most people are waiting for a thousand year old man to come out of hiding because he's been what they call occultation, the 12th Imam, and he's gonna come back and lead them to this great new era of peace and justice. Only that doesn't happen, a thousand year old man doesn't come. However, there's a group called the Shakis and they believe that this is going to be a young man between 20 and 30, and that does happen. May 23rd, 1844, the Bob comes, the gate, and the Bob comes to <coughs> the Shakies and they discover him and he gets, starts getting followers very, very quickly. The king hears about this and he sends his number, the Shah, sends the number one religious scholar, that his, his most trusted religious scholar, Vahid. And Vahid is a very esteemed man. He owns three houses. He, he knows the Quran literally back and for, backwards and forwards. He goes down to investigate the Bab. The king gives him a sword and Vahid publicly vows. He says, I'm going to kill the Bab if he isn't who he says he is. And Vahid is pretty sure he's not. Vahid gets down there very arrogantly, talks for about 45 minutes, and then the Bab starts talking. They end up meeting three times. The third time they meet, the Bab reveals right in front of Vahid the equivalent of one third of the Quran in a single sitting. He just reveals the word of God like a waterfall, hour after hour after hour. And after seeing this, Fahid says, if all the powers on earth were leagued against me, I would not abandon my confidence in this cause. And he doesn't. He becomes a follower. Several years later, he gives his life for the Ba. In fact, over 400 religious scholars become followers. He gets over 100,000 followers. And now the mullahs of Persia have to decide, what are they going to do? Are they going to accept this new prophet? This, this claimant to be the 12th Imam. He has a lot of evidence, 400 religious scholars, 100,000 followers. He seems pretty legit. And you see their, their own writings say that they're only in power until the 12th Imam comes. See, there's no clergy in Shia Islam. They're only borrowing the power from the 12th Imam until he comes. And so they have to give him the power if he is really the 12th Imam. So instead of doing that though, they put him in jail. That doesn't work because the jailer becomes a believer. They put him in another jail and that jailer is convinced of the Bob's truth. And so they put him on trial, they're running out of options. And he says, when asked who he is, I am, I am, I am the promised one you've been expecting for a thousand years. So they have to kill the Bob. And so on, on July 9th, 1850, they go to get him out of his cell. The Bob says, I'm sorry can't kill me now. No earthly force can take me until I'm ready to go. But they take him anyway. They tie him up against the wall. They tie up a niece, 20 year old follower. They put him in a public square and Sam Khan, the executioner gives the order. He's shot at 750 times by rifles. When the smoke clears from all the rifles, the Bob is simply not there, very much alive, but not there. Anise, his followers standing there unharmed. They finally find the Bob back in his cell, finishing his mission. And when they finally find him, he says, oh, I finished my mission, you can kill me. So they tie him up again, they tie up Anise again. They have to get an entire new regiment because uh, Sam Khan, the leader of the first regiment, who was an Armenian Christian, has said, I don't wanna do this anymore, you can shoot me. Um, they get another regiment, a Muslim regiment, and that Muslim regiment shoots and kills the Bab and Anis. <clears throat> they don't stop there. By 1852, over 20,000 of the Bab's followers lie dead. And there's only two main leaders left alive. One is a woman, one is a man. The woman is Tahere. Tahere pulls off her veil in 1848. And at the very first public conference of the Bab's followers, she announces that this is a new age for all humanity. She's the trumpet announcing this new age. She says, this is a new faith and a new age. And she says, in this new age, one of the big things is that women will be equal to men. Days later, Seneca Falls, New York, comes the first women's rights convention. Tahereh, meanwhile, back in Persia, she's teaching this new faith from behind a curtain because she can't be in the same room as men. Tahereh embarrasses the men. She's incredibly brilliant. She's also incredibly beautiful. And so as they're killing all the leaders, the Shah asks to marry her. And she says, no, you keep your religion, I'll keep mine. 
She keeps going. Eventually, they do arrest her. She puts on her wedding dress. She looks them in the eye and she says, you can kill me as soon as you like. But you cannot stop the emancipation of women. And so Tahiri goes to her death and that leaves only one left, only one leader, a nobleman, the son of one of the wealthiest men in Persia. Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. At an early age, around the age of 13, Baha'u'llah is already known for his great wisdom. All the leaders of his town are coming to see him. By his early 20s, he's known as the father of the poor. Much like Jesus Christ, he's known for helping the poor. He's known for early wisdom. Both of these things also were true of Jesus Christ, also of Muhammad, also of the Baha. Baha'u'llah becomes, he turns down a provincial governorship at 22 when his father dies, becomes a few years after that, becomes a follower and a great leader in the Babi cause. And eventually when he's the last one left, they arrest him. They put a hundred pound chains on his shoulders. They put him in a place called the Black Pit, three stories underground. This is a terrible place. It's dirty, it's smelly, it's dangerous. And in this terrible, awful, cold and dark pit, chained to other people, Baha'u'llah sees the vision of a maiden. The maiden says, you're the promised one of all faiths. For the Hindus, he's the 10th avatar. For the Buddhists, the fifth Buddha. For the Zoroastrians, the Shah Baram. For the Jews, he's the Messiah. And for Christians and Muslims, He's the return of Christ. And he comes out of this terrible place, the Black Pit, and he's exiled for 40 years, finally to the worst prison city in the Ottoman Empire in Akka, Palestine at the time, now Akko, Israel. And along the way, he reveals the equivalent of 60 Christian Bibles, 100 Qurans. And he says, it's time. He says, I've come with the most great peace promised in all the holy books. I am the Redeemer promised. And we need to get this most great peace. We need to do the following things. He says, we need to unite as a single human family. He says some really radical things. He teaches that women are equal to man. A woman should have all equal rights to men. This is very radical in the 1800s. He says that there's only one race, the human race, extremely radical then. Even more radical, the earth is but one country and mankind is citizens. People didn't think like that. Remember the, the world, was a lot bigger than we didn't have all the travel and commun communications we have now and the most radical thing of all and the thing probably most necessary for humanity to acknowledge and embrace is that there's only one religion of god one faith of god it's all separate religions but each religion is a beautiful chapter and he says you know <clears throat> moses taught us to love god and love our neighbor and jesus and and buddha and Zoroaster and Muhammad. And, and he said, when, when they taught that, when they taught us to love our neighbors and love our brothers, they meant all of our neighbors and brothers. And he says, it's time for us to stop fighting over religion and unite and understand that there is only one God. And God has told us through every messenger to love each other. And isn't it time to do that? And you look at the world today in 2021, look at the, the year we experienced last year. And even the crisis we have now with the flooding in Western Europe, the political problems we have, the pandemic, which we still have in places, isn't it time for us to understand that every man and woman is our brother and sister? Isn't it time for us to stop the fighting and start healing the world and start addressing things like global warming as a united humanity? We cannot fiddle while, while Rome burns. We need to listen to, to Baha'u'llah. God sends his messengers for a reason. He sends them with the message that's needed at the time. Baha'u'llah said he was the divine physician. And he says, that we have to be anxiously concerned about the needs of our age. And what is the greatest need of our age? Unity. There's only one God. Every religion says so. There's not a Jewish God. There's not a Muslim God. There's not a Christian God. And there's not a Baha'i God. There's simply God. And in every age, there's the faith of God. And those faiths should not be competing. They're all the faith of God. One day it was called Christianity. Another day it was called Judaism. Another day it was called Islam. Today that faith of God is called the Baha'i faith. None is better than the other. They're all one. 
Is my thumb any better than my finger? They're all fingers on the same hand. Each of them has it, its own purpose. Today, we need to unite. Today, we need to have peace. So with that, um, let me open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a really important topic. And, and I really love how you covered a lot of the details of the stories um, from the Baha'i and Babi faith. Um, yeah, now we'd love to open it up to questions. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can put it in the comment section. Our, our first question um, is, Baha'is believe that the Bible is scripture. How do you reconcile Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 10, that basically says, if we follow a false prophet, that automatically means we follow a false God. If that is true, how can we follow the same God? So if we go back to, um, you know, go back to the time of Deuteronomy, that's the time of the Jews. And at the time, this was a much, much, this is thousands of years ago. And people would follow, um, for example, they would, they would worship golden calves back then. They would worship, you know, stone statues. And that wasn't following God. So to Trevor's point, um, if someone was worshiping a stone statue or worshiping an, an iron calf, that wasn't worshiping God. Now, following a false prophet might be someone who, who says, go worship that calf or worship that statue. And then you wouldn't be following God. However, we cannot conflate that and say that, for example, Baha'u'llah is a false prophet because Baha'u'llah is Jesus Christ or is Christ returned and Moses returned. You know, all of the messengers, according to Baha'u'llah, are really one. And they're all telling us essentially the same thing. Every one of them, first of all, displays perfect wisdom, perfect compassion, perfect mercy, perfect justice, perfect truth, perfect knowledge. And so if we're following that, we're not following a false prophet. So the, the, the issue is, um, and I'll say this, it's falling in love with the lamp, the light of God shown, shown through Jesus Christ. It was that Christ spirit that made him. He was a perfect empty vessel. It was all God shining through him all the time. And that was the same thing with Baha'u'llah, all God shining through him. Same thing with Muhammad. Some people argue and say, well, Muhammad was this and Muhammad was that. But if we really look at his life, it was all light shining through him all the time. He had a lot of darkness around him, which people impute that to, to go to Muhammad. But he himself only fought defensive wars. He only taught love and justice and kindness. And he united this warring province, these warring provinces, I mean, these warring cities. So if you look at what a false prophet is, a false prophet is not any of the messengers of God. Anyone following Buddha is really following God. Anyone following Moses, following Jesus, following Muhammad. The problem we have in the world today is some people think, well, I'm following Muhammad, I can't follow Jesus, or I'm following Jesus, I can't follow Muhammad. And what we're saying as Baha'is is if you're following Jesus, you're already following Muhammad. And if you're fo if truly following Jesus, and if you're following Muhammad, you're already following the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Why are we fighting? Look at what they said. Um, one of the problems we have, uh, and Baha'u'llah talks about this, is religious leaders say, oh, no, don't look at that new one. But everyone should. They should investigate truth for themselves. And once you investigate truth, the truth of the Bab and Baha'u'llah and all the messengers before them is really obvious. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how did you become a Baha'i? Um, I became a Baha'i. I was raised Jewish and I was about 20 years old. I was in college and somebody came to the Jewish center on campus, which is called Hillel. And they gave this beautiful presentation on progressive revelation, better than the one I just gave. Uh, and, uh, I thought that's pretty cool. Um, I like the idea of there not being, you know, the Jews not being right and the Christians being wrong or, or the Christians being right and the Jews being wrong. I, di I, I didn't understand how one could be right and the other could be wrong because there's billions of Christians and there's a billion and a half Muslims and there's, let's say, 15 million Jews. That's even just 15 million Jews being wrong is a lot. And, and the way the Baha'i person who was there giving the presentation described it, it was like, well, the Jews are right and the Christians are right and the Muslims are right. Now, the Jews... We may disagree with the Jews on a couple of points, like we disagree with the Jews that, that Jesus was who he says he was. We, we, but, but Moses was right. And we disagree with Christians about who Muhammad was, but Jesus was right. And so I love this idea of the religions not having to fight anymore and really being one faith. 
And, and, and the only problem is not realizing that. And so I didn't do much with it. I ended up having a friend, a uh, very good friend named uh, Pastor Kevin, who uh, asked me to study uh, the Christian faith, which I started when I was in my mid twenties. I turned them down the first two times and finally I started reading the Christian Bible. And I came to the conclusion within a few months that, hey, I kind of like Jesus. And why did I not believe in him? I had never really thought. I think most people disbelieve in the messengers without really thinking about why they don't. And so I ended up, uh, I, I still study the Bible with, with, with Kevin. Actually, we're gonna study it tomorrow. I, I've been doing that weekly uh, on and off for over 30 years now. Um, when I was in my forties, I, I ended up my, one of my best friends, I was running with him and, and he and his wife asked me to study the Baha'i faith. And I went to study the Baha'i faith. And within a few, within a few years, I had gone through the same process I had with Jesus. I'm like, well, why don't I believe in Baha'u'llah? Who is this Baha'u'llah? And I started really understanding that Baha'u'llah, one day I really just had a, an epiphany that Baha'u'llah said he's the messenger for our age, for all humanity. And I realized he was. I'd read his writings, I'd studied his life, and I encourage everyone else, if they haven't done so, to do that. And I came to that conclusion. And Came home to my wife, ran home. I said, oh, I didn't run home, I drove home. And I said, I'm a Baha'i now. And my wife said, no, you're not. You're Jewish, I'm Catholic. The kids are gonna have a bar mitzvah in two and a half years, you have to wait. And it was while I was waiting for that bar mitzvah that I, I guess I, you might say Baha'u'llah summoned me to Akko. I um, was asked by a friend of mine, a very good friend, my brother, Bill Strickland, who uh, we built centers together. Uh, we're actually looking to build one in Northern Ireland now. We built one in, he asked me, uh, we, we started building one in Chicago after several conversations. He said, well, I'm, I'm th thinking about building this center in Akko, Israel for Jews and Arabs. And I almost fell out of my chair because Baha'is pray towards Akko every day because that's where Baha'u'llah is buried. It's the holiest place on earth. And here was this person who's not a Baha'i asking me to go there. So I went there. I, I stepped into the garden or the garden surrounding the shrine of Baha'u'llah. I stepped in one person. I, I walked out another Within six months, I was a Baha'i. I was teaching the faith all the time and um, became to this very day, a very, very passionate believer. I had um, a really strong spiritual transformation in a moment. And I saw that Baha'u'llah had brought a new age for all humanity and that we had world peace in that new age. And I really, it, it changed my heart and it changed my life. And I'm now a very happy Baha'i. Thank you so much. Um, next question is, in the Jewish tradition slash religion, they do not have a name for God. Some call him Hashem or Yad Vav He. Isn't God a generic name for our creator? What is God's name? And is it important that we know the name and not just refer to him as God? You know, people will fight about that all day long. You know, is he Adonai? Is he, is he Jehovah? Is he uh, this or that? Um, is he Dieu? if you're French, is he Dios, if you're Spanish, is he Allah, if you're talking in Arabic. Uh, I, I've seen many posts on Facebook where people say, well, uh, you know, Allah is a false God. And I always answer the same way. I say, I have a friend in, in, I have a very, very good friend and he prays to Allah and Allah is throughout his holy book. How do I fix my friend? And they all say, oh, you know, when introduce him to Christianity. I say, that's the problem. He's a Christian already. He's an, he's an Arab Christian. And of course they're like, what? You mean it's in the Bible? I said, it's all throughout the Bible. Allah simply just means God in Arabic. So you can call God by anything you want. One thing I would say, and I'll say this about God, is any conception that any of us has of God is really wrong because Baha'u'llah is very clear and the Quran is very clear as well that, that God is too big for us to understand. And so we're fighting about a God we can't possibly understand. The name is not important. As long as we say his name with reverence, the name is irrelevant. And then really what God commands us to do is love God. And I love God by every name of God. But Baha'u'llah has a, has a beautiful prayer called Blessed is the Spot where he says, you know, what's one, he talks about all these places and he says where the, you know, where God, where the name of God is glorified. What is it? I can't remember the name of it. Where, where basically God is praised and glorified. And, and that is really my attitude is just, you know, pray to God any which way you want, any religion. That's wonderful. And I commend people for doing that. Thank you. Um, the next question is, who fulfills the following prophecies? The return of the 12th Imam and the return of Christ. Is that Bob or Baha'u'llah? Um, the 12th Imam is, is definitely the Bob. 
and the return of Christ is Baha'u'llah. However, um, you could say that every that Muhammad was the return of Christ, that the Bab was the return of Christ, and that Baha'u'llah was the return of Christ. And if you look at the Bab's life, it's actually there's tremendous parallels between the Bab and Christ, and there's other parallels between Baha'u'llah and Christ. But the Bab was a uh, a very charismatic uh, messenger, just like Jesus. He uh, was young, just like Jesus. He had a short uh, ministry, like Jesus. He had many followers. Um, he had many more followers, actually, than Jesus. But he was also killed in a similar fashion to Jesus. And even the resurrection, you know, this whole thing about him not being killed the first time and being in a public square, a lot of parallels between him and, and Jesus. Um, in essence, as Baha'u'llah says, they're all one. So this messenger is a, is a perfect messenger that keeps returning. But uh, in terms of what they publicly said, it's very clear that Baha'u'llah referred to himself much more publicly as the return of Christ. And he wrote a letter to the Christians, which is quite beautiful. If anyone's Christian, um, I highly, highly recommend that you read Baha'u'llah's tablets, Christians. He also wrote an epistle to the Pope when he says, O Pope, rend thy veils, the Son of Man has come like he came before. Don't make the same mistake the Pharisees made and reject him without reason. So he very clearly told the Pope, I'm the return of Christ. The Pope didn't listen to him. Two months later, um, he declared himself infallible. And four months after that, he uh, actually lost the papal states, which he'd held for a thousand years. Thank you. Um, next question is, are you the only Baha'i in your family? I am. My wife's cousin became a Baha'i, and I think she has another cousin who's going to become a Baha'i. So, uh, but nobody in my family has become a Baha'i. Um, I get along very well with my family. Most of so my wife's family is all Catholic. My family is Jewish. Um, I suspect that over time, that maybe a couple more people might become Baha'i. But it's it's everyone's own journey. You know, most of my family is not searching like I was. In fact, I wasn't even that good a searcher, so I can't say I was that great at. It. I've seen much better seekers of truth. What I always tell people is seek the truth. And you seek and you shall find, as the Bible says. My family's more traditional Jewish, uh, wonderful people. It's just not, they're not interested in, in searching everywhere to see what truth is. Um, next question is, what if there is no God as it is traditionally believed in the traditional philosophy of religions? In some circles, there's a belief like science that it's just an intelligence in the world. As I said before, we can't understand God. Um, you know, I would read the religious texts, and I think the religious texts say very clearly that there's a God. Um, science and religion are not in, in conflict. According to Baha'u'llah, they must be in harmony. And so if you have religion without science, you get superstition, which we often have. And so because of that, because of this superstition in the name of religion, some people mistakenly believe that religion goes against science and it doesn't. And in the opposite, science without religion just evolves into materialism. You need, we need as humanity very clearly, science is amazing and the Baha'i faith is very, very complementary of uh, science. And uh, the, the Baha'i faith says um, that, you know, science is very necessary, but that tells us how the world works. Religion is really important to have a moral compass and to give us the whys of the world. And then they go together. There are two ways of looking at reality and it's a singular reality. The next question is, what do I do about Joseph Smith? I used to be Mormon. Well, I, you don't have to worry about Joseph Smith. He passed away in June of 1844. Um, Joseph Smith was a very charismatic man. He obviously has millions of followers today. Um, I would definitely say that there, there are aspects of what he taught that was correct. He made some amazing predictions. First of all, Joseph Smith uh, said, and as I mentioned in 1843, that there were those of, of you would not pass away before Christ returned. He was right about that. He made a prediction about uh, the Civil War in 1863, and that, would, that had to do with the return of Christ. And of course, in 1863 was the year that Baha'u'llah declared. And he made a prediction um, that if he lived to be 85 years old, which would have put him around 1890, 1891, he would have actually met Christ in person. And that was the year that the first Westerner uh, publicly uh, was uh, Professor Brown of Cambridge met Baha'u'llah in person. 
And if, if you haven't read the uh, record of that meeting, it's a really wonderful account that Professor Brown gives of his meeting of Baha'u'llah. So I think Joseph Smith was not a messenger of God. He didn't claim to be a messenger of God. Um, I'll be honest, I don't believe in the Book of Mormon as, as, a, as a divine text. Uh, it's actually been debunked to some extent. But I think he had some good things to say as well. And I think we should always take the good things uh, from everyone. I, I, Joseph Smith uh, had a translation of the Tablet of Abraham, which was also debunked after they found the Rosetta Stone. So I don't believe that Joseph Smith, everything he said was right. I, I'm not a believer in the Mormon theology, but the Mormons I've met have been very nice. And I believe that they try to follow the Bible and the Bible is the word of God. Mormons consider themselves Christians and I have a lot of respect for Christianity. It's just an earlier version of the Baha'i faith. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna pause to see if there's any other questions. Okay, um, the next question is, I'm the only Baha'i in our family. I'm 17 years old. My parents are not educated. Even, they're even unfamiliar with the alphabet. I'm so passionate to teach my parents. How can I teach my parents about the Baha'i faith? I think very gently, and I think the, the and, and this is, may surprise you, the number one way to teach your parents is to teach them by showing them who you are, by learning how to be the best Baha'i you can be. The best way to teach, and this is, this is me a few more years of being a Baha'i, the best way to teach is when you walk down the street, you walk down in such a way that people are so attracted to you that they ask you who you are, what are you, why are you the way you are? So be kind and loving and giving and, and really work to serve humanity to such an extent that people say, well, what is it that you're doing? What's, what's driving you? What's in your heart? What's in your soul? And when people ask you, then they're already interested. And then in terms of your parents, um, you know, I would just say, like anyone else, teach them a little bit at a time. Uh, you know, even if they're uneducated, uh, there's a great story of a, a man who was sweeping the floor and a great uh, Muslim teacher came upon it. And the man said something so profound, this is in Persia, in, in what's now Iran, that he actually converted this great Muslim teacher who became a great Baha'i. But the man had a very pure heart. And so even though your parents aren't educated, they may, and if you're a Baha'i, I, I would suspect that they have very pure hearts. So teach them in their hearts and teach them, you know, very, don't push them. If they don't want to hear more, don't tell them more. The one thing you don't want to do is inoculate someone against the Baha'i faith, which I've done. But what I, mean, and what I mean by that is I've tried so hard to teach people, I've pushed them away. And I love this faith so much, just like you do. And I really understand that you want to teach them, but take your time. Baha'u'llah says our job is to teach the faith. And then if someone wants it, great. If someone doesn't, that's okay too. Then pray for them and let them be on their way. Thank you. Any other questions? Let me, um, maybe if, if there's no more questions, talk about why the Baha'i faith is important today. And this is you know, so we know, at least that Baha'u'llah says he's the return of Christ. He's giving the instructions for today. If you look at the world today, you know, let's start looking at America. Um, I think most people here are probably from America. And America has been torn apart with racism, with political strife. Um, one of the things Baha'u'llah says is don't get involved in partisan politics. We can vote as Baha'is, but we cannot get involved. Look at the danger of partisan politics. Look, you know, uh, our government was almost taken over uh, with the insurrection uh, that happened earlier this year. I mean, that was a danger to our, our, our very democracy. I just read an article last week that there's police in Washington, D.C. who are now, um, who are, are re retiring in, in record numbers. And I, I talked to a, a friend who's a police officer in New York. There's all this strife going on. We need to turn our hearts and our minds to God. And that's really what Baha'u'llah was saying. Every time a messenger comes, they renew our faith. And we need to unite. Um, so I guess there's another question there. How do we make world peace a reality? It starts each of us in our own hearts. And it's really the, it's the recognition that every human being is a member of the human family. And it has to be in our hearts, not just our heads. I think most people in America recognize that we're one human family. 
intellectually, but we haven't taken that into our hearts. We have to realize that when anyone suffers, regardless of the color of their skin or the country they came from or the religion they were born into, that that's my suffering. And when we care about other suffering more than we care about ourselves, we will have world peace. When we understand that that a person in China matters too, or a person in England, and you know, if you're a man, that the suffering of women, or if you're a white person, the suffering of black people, someone who doesn't look like you is your brother and your sister. And when those of all of us fight for someone who's a little different than us, who thinks a little differently, who comes from a different background, we fight as if they were the closest person we ever met. That's how we get to world peace. And really, we need to really deepen ourselves, Baha'is included, in the writings of Baha'u'llah. He gave us a roadmap to world peace. Thank you. We have a, another question. Um, please expand on the, the passage, many will come in my name, but I shall come in the glory of my father. Well, the glory of my father literally translates out. This is Matthew, um, Matthew 16, 27 is one of those where it says, um, I will come in the glory of, of the father. And it's actually in there several times. Baha'u'llah is mentioned several times in the Bible. The glory of my father, the glory of God literally translates out to Baha'u'llah. If you were to write this in Arabic, it might come out as Baha'u'llah. So many come in the name of God. We mentioned Joseph Smith. Not to say, again, that Joseph Smith was all wrong, but there's a lot of people who started Christian sects. There's uh, there's people who say, I'm I'm the promised one. There was the Ahmadiyyas, uh, uh, Ghulam Ahmad, who claimed to be uh, the return of Christ. Okay. So people come, just like they did in the time of Jesus, and say, I am the promised one. How do we separate, um, the, and Trevor had kind of alluded to this before, how do we understand who's a false prophet and who's a true prophet? And First of all, Baha'u'llah has the right name, the glory of God. But beyond that, what, what separates him? Well, first of all, I think you look at their person. Um, I've actually read the writings of Ghulam Ahmad, and he curses a lot of his enemies. You never see Baha'u'llah do that. Baha'u'llah went through terrible tribulation. He had reason to curse people. He never, ever had that same attitude. He never had that human ego. You could see his writing is completely without ego. For 40 years, he's writing and writing and writing, and it's all beautiful sayings. Um, Thy heart is my home, sanctify it for my descent. He says, uh, O son of spirit, my first counsel is this, possess a pure, kindly, and radiant heart that thine may be a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. Muhammad said, and I think it's very telling Muhammad said this, he said that you could work your whole life and we could all combine together and you couldn't write one verse like the Quran. And Baha'u'llah is the same way. His writing is evidence of who he was. His life is evidence of who he was. The perfections. He perfectly reflected love and kindness. Uh, I have a story about uh, Baha'u'llah. <clears throat> I know someone who met someone. And this is an older person who'd met someone who's very old, who'd met both Baha'u'llah and his son, Abdu'l-Baha. And Abdu'l-Baha is known universally for his amazing kindness. So the person asked the person who met both Baha'u'llah and, and Abdu'l-Baha, was Baha'u'llah as nice as, and kind as, as Abdu'l-Baha? And she said, compared to Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha was me. And Abdu'l-Baha was, you know, if you ever met, if you met anyone on earth, Abdu'l-Baha would be kinder than anyone you would ever met, meet. He was a perfect exemplar, according to Baha'u'llah, of how to be a Baha'i. And so Baha'u'llah had superhuman kindness, superhuman. You know, some other things about Baha'u'llah which were very interesting is that um, his, he was so powerful that people couldn't look him in the eye. Um, there was an assassin that was sent to kill him and the assassin dropped his gun. Very many superhuman ideas and, and things. Baha'u'llah could see things. He could, um, one day someone wanted to visit him. He blinded the, the, the guards at the prison so the person walked right by the guards to visit him. Baha'u'llah could do many, many things, but the biggest thing is that he, his perfection is divine perfections. And so I think one of the things that we need to understand is how to recognize the messenger of God. Next question is, could you please explain when Jesus said, you will get to God only through me? Jesus never said that. Christ said it. Jesus, the man, didn't say it. Christ was saying that. And by the way, Buddha said it. 
Buddha said he was the way, Krishna said he was the way, Muhammad said he was the straight path. And Baha'u'llah explains it. The Bab said he was the way. There's direct quotes from all of them. And, and Baha'u'llah says, yes, they're all the way because they're all Christ. Christ is the way in every age. That, that divine spirit of God that's shining through these empty vessels. You see, Buddha was a perfect empty vessel. Jesus was a perfect empty vessel. And again, as I said before, we must love the light, not the lamp. When we love the lamp, we miss the light. The light is what matters. The next question is, how would you respond when a Christian says the Baha'i faith is a false prophet or message as His Holiness Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and life? Same way I just responded. You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. So is Baha'u'llah because Baha'u'llah is Christ. So it's Christ saying this, not Jesus saying it. Um, the next question is, if I follow Baha'u'llah properly, does that mean I'm following Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, Krishna? Then if I follow Buddha properly, does that mean I'm following Baha'u'llah? Yes, absolutely. The next question is, although humanity is going through challenges, still it is sometimes difficult to teach as there's so much conspiracy. So how do we invite people to a devotional or study circle? Just invite them and, and don't worry about who comes. Whoever comes, comes. You know, I think one good way is to talk about the problems of humanity and say, and really focus on those problems and say, have you thought about solutions? Hey, we have some solutions. Would you like to hear them? You know, talk less about Baha'u'llah and say, yes, you know, Baha'u'llah is, oh, by the way, Baha'u'llah has some answers, but here's why it's important. So really, you know, we have to, as Baha'is, solve those problems through Baha'u'llah. Any other questions? Um, why do people think Baha'u'llah is a false prophet? When I started studying to become a Baha'i, some of my friends think I'm wrong. The biggest reason people think that Baha'u'llah is a false prophet is because religious, religious leaders who desire to keep their own power have said so. I don't think anyone, I'm going to be very blunt when I say this, I don't think anyone who's actually studied the words of Baha'u'llah would have anything to say. I mean, how much can you fight against the idea that we're supposed to have world peace, that we're supposed to love each other, that there's one human race, that the earth is but one country and mankind and citizens. These things are obviously true. That women are equal to men, spiritually. Women are, are the spiritual equals of men. Um, all of these things are obviously true. But religious leaders who desire, have a selfish desire to hold their own power, say, oh, he's a false prophet. You know, what we have to understand is nobody owns the prophets of God. The religious leaders who are Christian don't own Jesus. And, and the Muslim leaders don't own Muhammad. All of them came for all of us. Muhammad came for every every person. So did Jesus. So did so did Baha'u'llah. So to think that again, this is holding on to the lamp, not the light. We need to let go of the lamp and love the light of God. Truly love God. And uh, Sue is correct. When you start asking questions about the Bible, look at the Bible itself and see what it says. The Bible has many references to Baha'u'llah. In, in Revelation 21, uh, 21, 10 and 11 refers to Baha'u'llah by name. 21, 23 refers to Baha'u'llah. talks about this uh, new Jerusalem coming down from the sky and the light of God, the light of the glory of God lighting it, the light of Baha'u'llah. It's very direct, actually. Our next question is, do you have any examples of how and in what way Baha'u'llah is the same personage slash spirit as the previous messengers? So, um, again, the perfect reflection of God. First of all, if you start reading their writings, they're very similar. They're all teaching love, compassion, mercy, justice. They all have a version of the golden rule. Um, they are all uh, very detached from this physical world. None of them. So here's some things that you can look at. Every messenger is true. Every messenger has come at a dark time. Every messenger has suffered. Every messenger is very pure. Every messenger is infinitely kind, loving helping the poor. Every messenger is always truthful. Every messenger is really reflecting all of compassion, mercy, justice, peace, all of them. Where they differ is some of their social laws and teachings, and those are because in their perfection, in God's perfection, in the messenger's perfection, he's giving the message for each age. So, but those, those are not differences among the messengers. That's the same messenger, essentially giving the message in the age they come. 
And this last one's a good one. Um, can you comment on the Baha'i principle of spiritual solutions to the economic problems in the world? Yes, I can. Um, number one, so I'm, I'm very wealthy. I'm, uh, my company I founded went public. And um, what I think is, first of all, people of great wealth have to use that wealth. They have to, but they have to change in spirit. And that's one of the big things. Um, so the, the spirit, you spiritually have to, have to take your money and use it to help the world. We have to design systems that are, are in, in line with the Baha'i teachings, in line with honesty and justice and truth. And if we don't do that, we will have corruption like we have now. And it's, corruption is tremendously inefficient. We have poverty, great poverty and great wealth. We need to really design our systems so every human being is treated as a child of God. And that's the spiritual solution to the economic problems. Okay. Um, so Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In this scripture, John 14, 5, the way Baha'is read this, Jesus was speaking in the spirit of Christ as the Son, referring to the Father. The Son points the way to the Father, um, our Father. Is it one of the clouds that prevents people from seeing this? What are these clouds that obscure the light of the Son of reality today? Um, so clouds of materialism, clouds of atheism, uh, fundamentalism, very much these very passionate beliefs that have political, there's political clouds, for example, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, and that becomes people's religion. We have so many things that turn us away from God. Drugs, alcohol, drugs and alcohol are a big problem. So what we should be doing is every day try and get closer to God. So these clouds are these mistaken ideas. It, uh, the divisions like racism and sexism are clouds. But I, I'd say the biggest cloud in America is materialism, the idea that we can buy our way to heaven. Next question is, what should Baha'is do to um, expedite reaching world peace? Absolutely teach the faith and teach the faith some more and tell people that Baha'u'llah is coming and get people to read his writings. We will not have world peace in our hearts until we, until we read his writings, all of us, including Baha'is. Is fear of making a mistake and burning in hell forever one of the clouds? Yes. So the idea that if you abandon Jesus, that you will burn in hell forever. This is a typical Christian thing. Um, the Baha'i faith does not believe in an eternal hell. We believe in hell and heaven as spiritual states. And we don't believe that you're abandoning Jesus by acknowledging his return. In fact, by acknowledging the return of Christ, you're actually accepting Christ. So I became essentially, a, you might say, a born-again Baha'i. I had the, the spirit of Christ enter me, just like a Christian would. Um, we're really acknowledging Christ in all his incarnations, in all his, I'd say not incarnations, in all his manifestations, because Christ doesn't incarnate. In other words, God doesn't incarnate in the human being. He's reflected. So in all these perfect messengers, we're acknowledging Christ. Um, that's a really good question. So if a man obeys Buddha properly, he obeys Baha'u'llah. So why do we need Baha'u'llah? The social laws and teachings are updated in every age. And so Baha'u'llah says the teachings for a previous age can never be acceptable for the current age. And so the reason we need Baha'u'llah is he's giving the social laws and teachings needed for humanity to unite in this modern age. Can you explain about life after death, comparing the Christian, Christian or Muslim perspective to the Baha'i one? Um, so I'm, I'm not as expert on the Christian or Muslim perspective, but I think most Christians and Muslims believe in life after death. I think the Baha'i teachings on life after death are much more uh, detailed, just like they are on most subjects. Um, the, some Christians think there's a physical life after death. Baha'is don't believe that. We believe that there's a spiritual life after death and that, that death is really a birth. So we really. We're, we're really born again into this next world as a spirit. So our, our body dies and our spirit goes to the next world. And it's actually a big step forward.
Um, The other reason we, uh, one other thing on why we need Baha'u'llah is to renew the teachings of Buddha. See, with Buddha, uh, we did not have anything in writing for over 300 years. So a lot of the teachings of Buddha and Christ Jesus and Muhammad even have been lost. Even though we have the Quran, you know, over time, those, those writings are corrupted. So we, we need this renewal in every age. So it's not just the new social laws and teachings, but it's spiritual renewal. Can you please clarify or explain the Trinity in Christianity? So that would be God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit coming through Jesus. God, the Father, Muhammad, the Son, the Prophet, and the Holy Spirit coming through Muhammad. God, the Father, Buddha, the Son, the Messenger, and the Holy Spirit coming through him. So it's a, it's an, it's a, a way to describe God and his messengers, and it would apply to all of God's messengers. So it's, it's just as true for Baha'u'llah as it is for Jesus. I think that's all our questions. Looks like that's all. Well, thank you so much again, Mr. Sarowitz. That was a great talk and great um, follow-up discussion. We hit a lot of topics that I think are really important today. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. It is my pleasure. Um, I appreciate everyone joining us and uh, happy to be on again. Thanks for having me back. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. So um, just to quickly announce next week's speaker, we'll have Ms. Erica Toussaint Brock, and she'll be speaking on who was Abdul Baha. And again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. So if you're not already on our mailing list, you can fill out the Google contact form that I've put in the chat. I'll put it again. And um, you can watch all of our talks afterwards on YouTube. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.